Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Nina. I'm all the way from the Netherlands. As explained, I drove here with my old uh, Volvo. <laughs> um, I wanted to tell you something about what I do. Um, it is a presentation that I used before, so I'll sometimes skip through some slides. But uh, I call myself a web cartographer, which means that I make maps, uh, which are online, interactive, and I develop them from the back end to the front end and implement this all through code. So my background is a bit different. I actually studied art academy before I went to study uh, geoinformation science. Uh, afterwards, I started working as, um, oh, the slide is not all on the screen. I started working as a, a web cartographer at a company and now I started, uh, a few years ago, I started as a freelancer. I really love to make creative stuff. So these are also some of the maps that I make. You can check out my work on my website, uh, ninab.nl. Um, but everything I do is open source. So these are some of the open source tools I use. Um, QGIS, PostGIS, GeoServer, MapServer, and the web development is JavaScript and all kinds of uh, mapping libraries. And my computer is in on, on Ubuntu at the moment. Um, I also know a lot about open data, so I'll use a lot of, of OpenStreetMap, but also the other ones are like the open data of the Dutch government. So let's talk about maps. Um, I really like to start always with this quote, everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. This is the first law of geography, and you can see it almost everywhere. If you look at the news, um, you live in Italy, you won't hear anything that happens in the Netherlands, and I live in the Netherlands, I never hear anything about what happens in Italy, except if there is somebody from the Netherlands, maybe on holidays in Italy, and they they get ill or they drown or something happens, then you hear about it. So we really focused on our own local geographic area. We are more related to stuff that is close to us geographically than that of what is far away from us. Also, we think spatially. Our brains are organized spatially and we have no choice but to think and see in a spatial kind of way. So maps can give us uh, an insight into the complexity of these things. So maps make sense of, out of things. Maps are a simplification of reality. So these complex environments that we live in, uh, we can reveal patterns and relationships through, them, relationships through them. So a map could be defined also as a collection of geodata. And you probably all work with data, but what is so special about geodata? Uh, geodata is data with a location. So we really talk about a location somewhere on the Earth. So a location that you can pinpoint on the Earth. And then we divide that into three different categories. This is how it works in GIS. We have points, lines, and polygons. So a point is just a point with an X and Y coordinate. A line is built up out of multiple points, which are connected. And then a polygon is built out of points, which are built up out of lines, and they lines to form a surface. With every object that we make, we can have attributes describing what the point, the line, or the surface is. For example, the point can be a tree, uh, the line could be a road, and the polygon could be a house. So we call that attributes, which describe what these objects or features are. So maps and geodata allow us to communicate all together in a common framework. This common framework, we also gave it a name. It's actually what I'm talking about, our coordinate system. So um, this, this co uh, coordinate system allows us to communicate about a location or a distance on the Earth's surface. But we have this round Earth and we have all these flat maps. So how does that work? To start off, actually the Earth is not round. It's a really complex geoid. But we decided, because that's way too complex, to draw a circle around it and just say it's an ellipsoid. Makes it more easy. We divided that ellipsoid into, uh, with lines, uh, horizontal and vertical lines, our latitude longitude system, into this 3D model of the Earth. And with this 3D model, we can almost describe every location on the Earth. And you all use it. It's our GPS system. 
So this is the most well-known uh, coordinate reference system out there. It's called the WGS84. And it measures its it location in longitude and latitude decimal degrees, and you all have it on your phone, your GPS systems work with that. It's also the most standard way to store geodata on the web. Uh, that's a file format, GeoJSON. As you can see, JSON is the JavaScript object notation. This is the geo format for it. But still, we're talking about a 3D model. We haven't talked about that flat map. So how do we go from this 3D model to a flat map? This is what we call a projected coordinate system, which is the mathematical projection or translation from our 3D globe to a 2D flat map. You can do this in all kinds of ways. But one of the mostly used uh, systems that we use is the web mercator projection. It's really, really square. Uh, the shapes are a bit distorted, but it was actually used for ships that they could uh, go sh from a straight line from Europe to America. Um, so we store our data in the WGS system, but we always display it in Web Mercator. This is also what you will find on the web. Everybody is using the Web Mercator projection, but it is really, really wrong. It's like taking an orange peel and try to get the orange peel off and put it in a flat square on the table. You won't be able to do that. So what is happening? They divide it up into these squares, and then this, the further you get away from the equator, the squares are actually like stretched out to form a complete square. Um, yeah, this is a bit, I don't know the Italian system, this is the Dutch system. So we all have local coordinate systems to make it even more better to uh, determine the location and the size uh, in a local way. So instead of using the big ellipsoid, we made a smaller ellipsoid, like ellipsoid B, which fits the earth a little bit better on a specific place. And that is what our local system is based on. Yeah, if it's all really confusing, you can always find some materials online to read. So now we know what geodata is. The next thing is, how do we put this on the web? Um, it works as most stuff. Of course, we have our database full of geodata. We have to put a server in between, and you want to view it in the browser. I'm just going to skip some thingies. Um, there are a lot of tools in the GIS world uh, that you can use. Um, there's a lot of data, so this is a bit of an overview of the tools out there. This is really about the data, the databases that are out there, the desktop software you can use. This is all about hosting and surfing the data. And then there's a lot of tools in the front end and in the cloud that you can use to visualize it in the front end. If you ever work with geodata on the web and you get really confused, no worries, it's not your fault. So what happened actually is the GIS world has developed uh, itself pretty well, but it did it separately than the, from the World Wide Web. So as you can see on the left, we have the World Wide Web, and you can also see that Google is in the, on that side. And on the other side, you have the OGC and the geospatial domain. Um, which developed standards and services which are not easy to understand if you're working uh, on the web. So as a web developer, if you ever get confused, it's not your fault. In the geospatial world, we have the OGC, which is the Open Geospatial Consortium that defined some standards for sharing and exchanging geodata on the web uh, already a long time ago. So for example, we have the WMS services, which send over images of maps. We have WFS services, which send over features over the web. And then on the other side, there is more the community standards, de facto standards that were developed by the companies themselves. For example, Google has its own system, Microsoft has its own system, um, and recently also Mapbox came in and developed a standard called Vector Tiles. I'll tell you a little bit more about it later on. Um, what is really nice to know is that these days the W3C and the OGC are talking together to get more uh, and better standards that uh, 
in which you can share your GIS data on the web. So the standards that are coming along, it's called the OGC APIs. They are providing better web standard APIs for sharing data on the web. And then hopefully also geodata is going to be able to be indexed on the web as well and more findable. So having a map in the, in the web browser means actually that you're looking at a tiled web map. Google Maps does this, OpenStreetMap does this, every, actually map, every map you see in the browser works this way. So let me get back a little bit. Um, before we put maps on the web, we only had digital maps and GIS software. And then they tried to put a map on the web. But it was really, really, really slow. Because they just put a big image on the web. And it wasn't until like 2004, 2005 that they found a better solution for quick online mapping. And the solution was tiles. If you watch this uh, series on Netflix, you'll also see a little bit of this uh, ID that came along on how to divide all this data up into tiles. So it's a good tip to watch. So what are tiles? Tiles are small images of 256 by 256 pixels. We place them in a grid that share the same boundaries. Uh, so that in the end you have one big map that you look at. And we can transfer all these little images way faster than one big map. And we use the same system everywhere, so we call that slippy maps or the X, Y, Z maps. They all use the same system in which they place all these images, so you can have a seamless map that you look at. Every zoom level on the map also has its own set of tiles. So when we start with zoom level zero, we actually just have one image for the whole world. Then if you go to zoom level one, it's divided up into four tiles, zoom level two, 16 tiles, et cetera, et cetera. I think it makes a little bit more sense to show you in an interactive way. So here they have like a visualization of how this system works. So this is the whole world. You're looking at one tile. I zoom in and it's divided into four, uh, divided again, etc., cetera, et cetera. So for example, if I look at the Netherlands, I'm looking at tile uh, 1610 in the XY grid and then at zoom level five. So all these styles are styled beforehand and styled uh, in their own specific kind of way. Then you can put all these styles somewhere on the server and you can request them in the front end. So this is the standard way on how to request a tile. So this is the zoom level that you're looking at and then the X and Y position in the grid. So every tile is just an image that's somewhere on the web. So this is just a plain PNG image that you can also look at separately. So this is how you make the tiles. You have your really big bucket of geodata. You define your styling, what color are the roads, what color are the buildings, the trees, etc. You put that through a renderer, and the renderer generates this tile cache. So this big bunch of files, all the little PNG tiles, which are ready to be requested by the front end. I'm going to skip this. There are some disadvantages to these raster tiles, which we call, is that you're just looking at a plain image. So there's no information about the objects anymore. Um, it's, you can't click on it, and then the computer won't know it's a house, or it doesn't know it's a road. So there's no information. Also, if you want to have a different visualization, so you want to have like a gray scale, you want to have a light, you want to have a darker scale, a dark themed map, means that you have to render all these images again. So you have to have like separate caches for all the tile sets uh, with the different colors. But this has been like the way to make maps for a long time and it's still happening a lot. But there is also some new technology. I think this exists now for 10 years, something like that. If you look at Google Maps, they're using vector tiles. Uh, maybe some governments still use raster tiles, but vector tiles are really up and coming. So what is different? The old tiles, the raster tiles, were just PNG images which exist out of pixels. 
But the vector tiles really exist out of the data itself. So it contains the features. But they do it in a really, really smart way. So the features are put in a tile in a matrix of 256 by 256. They use the same tiling scheme as the raster tiles. So you just placed in the same scheme. But then they're also really, uh, they're really encoded in a binary format. The geometries are simplified and then they're compressed. So the vector tiles eventually are really small. Sometimes they're even smaller than the PNG images. So this is how you make the vector tiles. You have your big bucket of geodata. Uh, when some kind of processor, you decide what data is gonna be in which tiles and you have your vector tile cache somewhere on the server. But then the difference is that in the browser, you define the styling and the map is rendered. So before with the PNG tiles, you have to render it on the server uh, and you visualize it in the browser. Here the rendering happens in the browser. So next to the vector tiles, you will also always need to send the styling uh, document to the, the page. So what are the advantages? Renderings done on the client side, so less server loads. You can have custom styling on the client side. Actually, you can have multiple visualizations on one tile set. The tiles are really small, they're really fast. Because it's vector based, it's also in a really high resolution. And you have direct access to feature information. So if you click on a building, the computer knows it's a building. If you click on a road, it knows this is a road. So that's also less uh, server load with extra requests to your server. Then the rendering is done with WebGL. So it uses the own device uh, graphic processing unit. Um, so also, the, that's a little bit what you don't have in control is how fast it's rendered, because that really depends on the device your, your clients are using. But what is really cool about vector tile maps is that you can rotate and tilt a map now, you can have a 3D kind of feeling, and it has this smooth infinite zooming. How does that look like? So you can zoom in, you can rotate a map, you can tilt a map. This wasn't possible with the raster tiles before. Also visually, it looks a bit, or, bit more smooth. So for example, if you really focus on the label of Amsterdam, on the left you will see like little jumps. So it jumps from one tile set, zoom level tile set to another. On the right you see the vector tiles, which more interpolates also between the zoom levels. And you can make cool like 3D stuff. This is a visualization of all the buildings in the Netherlands in 3D. This wasn't possible with the raster tiles before. Mm, I'll skip this. And what is really cool is that you can have a little bit of interactivity with JavaScript. Um, and I really like that, so I like to do some creative styles. Uh, this was a style that is based on like an old uh, map and what I try to do, I have to look really well. Oh yeah, I try to put some random com component in there. So if you look really well, you can see like a coffee stain over here. Can you see it on the beamer? There's a coffee stain. And then if you move it out of view, it jumps to somewhere else. So now it's here. So there is a little random visualization in there to give the whole map, uh, yeah, an old fashioned dirty look. Um, but also, this was also for fun, I could just add some random air balloons on the map that just jump around every time you look somewhere else. Yeah, these were some like fun examples that I tried to make, but it's also really useful. Um, somebody asked me, like, can you increase the labels? Like, uh, I don't have my reading glasses with me, could you just like turn up the label size? And that's something that you can do now with vector tiles. Yeah, so this is also like a dashboard that I work on and we have these things that you can turn off the labels, you can pick like administrative labels or topographic labels. This is all happening in the browser. So these are all visualizations on the vector tiles. This doesn't cost any uh, server uh, communication at all. It just happens in the browser and that's amazing. This wasn't possible with the raster tiles before.
I have no idea how much time I have left, actually. So somebody should just call me, like, to maybe seven minutes. Okay. So we talked about the tiles. What can you use for the front end? Uh, of course, JavaScript. Um, a map is a lot, so you want to have the whole interface, the interaction, you want to add some layers, you want to zoom in, you want to pan it and click it. Have some pop-ups in there, some markers. There are a lot of JavaScript libraries out there for mapping. This is a bunch of them. I'll just go through them really quickly, quickly to give you a little bit of an idea on when to use what. So, I uh, don't know if you know about D3S, but that's a library for data-driven infographics, and it also has a geo component in there for if you want to make small infographic maps. Um, TurfGS is actually a geospatial computation uh, library, so you can do some small GIS calculations in the browser. Um, if you ever want to start with web maps, go for Leaflet. It's a really, really small, lightweight uh, library for raster web maps. So that's really easy to start with. Open Layers is a little bit more elaborate than Leaflet, so it has way more GIS functionality in there. So that will be your next step. Then, of course, there are some um, uh, commercial uh, software out there. So RTS JavaScript API is pretty cool, but that's only if you use S3 software. Uh, for the vector tiles, Mapbox TL invented the vector tiles, so use that if you ever want to work with vector tiles. But then Mapbox DL changed their whole license plan uh, like a few months ago, so they changed from version 1 to version 2, and now there is a, not an open license anymore on it. So if you want to use the open license version, version 1 got forked to Map Libre, so that's an open source vector tile project at the moment that a lot of people are using instead of Mapbox. Uh, and then there's also some cloud solutions. So if you just want to drag and drop your data into a studio, use Carto or Mapbox in the cloud. And then as of course, here maps and Google Maps, which are great if you want to work with navigation. So if you want to do route planning, then you must of course use something like Hero Maps or Google Maps. Yeah, the main considerations, I think, is do you want to use open source, closed source uh, software? Is it something you want to make a mobile or a desktop map? Do you want to use raster or vector tiles? What's the amount of interactivity you want to have? Do you only need a map that shows your office? Then just uh, take leaflet. But do you want to have a lot of GIS functionality with measuring and calculating with geodata? Then use something more uh, complex like open layers. And I'm not going to do that. I'm going to conclude a bit. So I think maps are everywhere these days. You see them a lot. Everybody uses GPS. Everybody's making maps. And there has also never been so much open data available and so much open source software that you can use to make a map. So it's not only cartographers anymore. I think there is a lot of hobbyists out there, a lot of journalists nowadays making maps as well. Um, which is amazing, um, but we also have to think about that web mapping is more than just cartography. It's about making data-driven uh, visualizations, about re responses to signs. Maybe we can personalize maps. Google Maps is already doing this, so depending on your personal account on Google, they change the map on what your preferences are. For example, if you have a dog, maybe like the pet shops show up more, but if you like beers a lot, the pubs might show up a little bit more on your map. So maps have become this um, interactive thing. It's not a flat map anymore. I have to just... Yeah, no, I don't have to slide on that. But uh, maps have become more than just a paper map that we used to have in our car to look around where we are. They are interactive, and we have to develop them with code these days. And also, I think for developers, it's really important that whenever you make a map, you think about how to make a good map. And that's, I think, the next thing. All maps lie. Um, be really, really careful if you make a map. I think this was a great example. Trump just, this was a, the Sharpie gate uh, image. <laughs> he, he took a Sharpie to just said, no, the hurricane is also going to hit there. 
Um, everybody can make a map. Everybody can manipulate maps. So be really careful with what you do. Because uh, with maps, you can visualize a lot of data quickly and efficiently. But it can also visualize a lot of data inaccurately and misleadingly. Yeah, and I have some examples on that. These are like the geographic profile maps, which are actually just population maps. So whatever data you put on there looks like they are connected, but it just shows the population distribution. Uh, I also like this one, just put a lot of words in there and then you can make anything you want. It's as you said, you make fun of Florida all the time. So there's a lot of power to making maps. And there's also a lot of easy mistakes that we can make. Um, one of the main mistakes are made is this. If you put uh, absolute data in a chloroplat map, so you have areas that you give a certain kind of color, it can be really, really misleading on what you're looking at. So we should always normalize this data um, or not use these kinds of visualizations at all. So for example, you see the big red uh, square in the middle. It looks like that's like really heavily red, but it's just a bigger area with less population over there. So if you don't normalize these maps, it can be really wrong in interpreting it. Um, also, heat maps are becoming very, very popular, but look out with those as well. They can be really misleading. So on the left, you see the heat maps. You lose a lot of detail. Uh, so you can't see the difference between this red dot and the big red dot over here. And there's also something about the interpolation method with heat maps, which can give areas the idea of a really high density, well, it's actually not. Wrong classification, this is actually the same data, but they just classify differently. It shows the amount of Muslims in Europe, and it just because the classes are different, here it looks like there are a lot of Muslims in France, and here it looks like there are none at all. And it's the exact same data, but you can tell different stories with that. So always check how you make your map, but also maybe always check if there's a map, how it's defined. Too much data can make your map slow. Um, I also always love this. If you work with geodata and you work with coordinates, all the software systems are set to a default of 15 decimals degrees, the decimals behind the, the dot. But if you do that, it's like using this, I think, which is an accuracy on the world of a specific sand grain. So using 15 decimals is way too much. You can always get just get rid of the last decimals. I always put my data on five or six decimals, which is uh, pointing to a specific person in a room, which is most of the time fine. Uh, never ever use more than six or seven decimals in your coordinate systems. Yeah, and also like this one, but this I think this goes for every kind of data. If you torture it long enough, it will confess to anything. So this is, uh, it's in Dutch. It says like journalists discovered a really dangerous network out of these uh, cloud of dots. They found this uh, really dangerous network. It doesn't show on the beamer, does it? The color is gone on the beamer. No, you can't see it. You should check on my laptop. So it has the... <laughs> That's really strange, right? <laughs> the whole joke is gone. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's the censorship on the, from the Beamer. So watch out, cartography is inherently an instrument of power, had it's always been. So if you want to make a map, be careful and make a good map. Uh, cartography is power. Anyway, I really like maps and I think a lot of people love good maps and I really like to make them. So um, that was it. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to come over to me.